This next section deals with the types of housing that we are going to be dealing with. So let's go over here and look at the different types of housing that we have. Now, I will warn you, I am not an artist, so please bear with me. I am a numbers guy. Actually, if I told you what my degrees were in, it would shock you. But technically, I'm a numbers guy, so please bear with me. The first type of property is this thing that we are going to call a single family residence. Now, understand that that is the top view of a house. I've had somebody go, why'd you draw an envelope on the paper? It's not an envelope, all right? So what we have here is the yard and this is the house, okay? So this is the most common property and it's called a single family residence and then you will often see detached, meaning it's standalone. It is detached from any other building there is. A SFRD, single family residence, detached. That is probably what most 85% of you out there watching this actually live in. A single family residence, detached. That's the first one. Now. There are these other two that we have to talk about. So here's the land. There's two houses. That's the top view of two houses. But there's the lot line. So looking down on the top of this, and maybe I should have done this better, is the actual view of two houses that are attached. A lot of people out there are looking at me and saying that's a double or a duplex. Incorrect. This is a single family residence attached. And the way of that you know that is because there are one lot, two lots, and then the associated houses. So imagine taking two houses that are on detached and you push them together so that they're actually touching, but they're actually on their own legal address. They actually own the property. And a lot of times you will hear this sign is called a zero lot line because they are pushed right to the edge of the lot and they are touching together, but they still are a single family residence. Now, contrast that with this picture where you've got the one lot, and this is the one that most of you are thinking about, where you've got two residences One residence, two residents, but it sits on one lot. That is a double or a duplex. I want you to notice this lot and this lot are two distinct lots. Now, we haven't got to the legal address yet, but trust me for a moment when I tell you it's two distinct legal descriptions. Therefore, you have one lot that fits right here and a second lot that is right here. They share a zero lot line. These houses are just pushed to the edge. Unlike here, where we only have one lot, this whole thing is just one lot. There are two residents. This is the double or the duplex. And the point being is you can't visually see a lot line. So this is where your counseling might come in when someone says, oh, well, I own this house 
And here's the one legal description. And you go, well, are there two houses? Yeah. Okay, well, you own a double. And we can sell it as a double. In this scenario here, when you're talking to the guy or the seller, they're going to say, well, we own a lot and this is our lot. That guy beside us has his own tax bill. Oh, that's a single family attached. And I can only sell this side. And that is a whole separate person. So you must understand that single family attached and a double are actually two different properties. They may look the same, but they are not. All right. <clears throat> now there's three other properties here. And like I explained once before, I am not an artist. So I'm going to try and draw these three properties, but for the sake of this discussion, let's assume they are identical. And what you have is this thing called a condo, a co-op, and an apartment complex. So in this drawing, we have four units. One of these buildings is a condominium. A condominium is where you own the property and a prorated portion of all the common area. An apartment, you understand, is a unit that you may lease from another person where a co-op. Now, does everybody understand what the word co-op means? Co-op is where a bunch of people give money into a company and then that company buys the building. So the actual owner is the company where each individual person may have shares of stock in that company. The problem with these three is, as you can tell, is that they are visually identical. So I want to ask you guys, which one of these three is the co-op? Which one is the apartment? Which one is the condominium? All right, let me help you out. Let's say I want the word If I ask you and said, hey, what does the word to mean? Could you answer that question? The answer is no, you could not because you do not know which two I'm talking about. You need to understand the context of the question. If I told you I had two shoes, you would know I'm talking about number three in that case because of the context of the sentence. If I said, hey, I want to go to the park, that's number one. And you're going to the store, I want to go to. That would be <laughs> the number two. The same is true when you're looking at this real property. If someone here says, well, I own Unit A in fee simple, which you don't know what that is, but just trust me. I own unit A and I own 25%. Why 25? Because there's four of them. I own 25% of all the common area, like the workout, the tennis court, the pool. You would say, oh, you live in a condo. because of the words or the context that he explained. If she says, I have a lease on unit A and I pay rent, you're going to say, oh, you live in an apartment, even though they visually look the same. And then the third person says, well, I have 25% of the shares of stock and I sit on the board of directors and I have a proprietary lease. This is a word you should write down somewhere. It is in your ebook. 
I proprietary lease. This word is very important right here. A proprietary lease basically is a lease to yourself. Okay? So in other words, even though four of us have owned the company, we have all agreed that I'm going to live in A and you're going to live in B and she's going to live in C, even though I own 10% of your condo. I'm sorry, back up. Even though I own 25%, because there's four, even though I own 25% of your condo, I just can't come walking in while you're in the shower and go, hey, I own part of this, I'm here. No, because we have a proprietary lease with each other saying that I control unit B and you control unit A. This is the co-op. Now, co-ops are actually falling out of favor because a lot of lenders have issues with saying, I'm going to loan you money, but you're actually not buying the real property. You're buying shares of stock in a company that owns the property. And here's another bad thing about co-ops. Because it's actually shares of stock, if you want to decide you want to sell your shares of stock, these other three people actually could have an input on your ability to sell because they don't think the buyer of your shares of stock are qualified. Because remember, or think about, if A, let me, the best way to explain this. Let's say this building needs a new roof and the company says, we gotta buy a new roof. And the new roof is $40,000. Each person, since there's four, I did hope easy math. Each person would owe 10 grand to the company so the company could put a new roof on their building. Well, if we, the three of us, determine that you're selling to a person that may not be financially capable of doing that, guess what would happen when that $40,000 bill pops up and this new owner of A goes, well, I don't have 10 grand. The other people would have to pick up the slack because it still has to be paid. So there is a lot of times when B, C, and D may go, we don't approve the sale to that person because they are not financially strong enough to uphold the requirements of a 25% owner in the property. Yes, they can afford to spend a hundred grand to buy your shares, but now they're out of money. What do we do moving forward? So there is actually input or control by the rest of the party. Now, that is the common issue. The it, big issue with this is now you could start to see where there could be some bad manipulation. These three people could go, well, that kid doesn't go to so-and-so school or doesn't belong to the right yacht club. So we are not going to approve that. That could lead into further issues. That person's the wrong religion. We're not letting you sell. That person's the wrong color. So you can quickly see where this could have issues because of the third, these other parties actually will have a say in the sale as opposed to over here in the condo when unit a says i'm selling my fee simple my portion only the other people don't have a say so those are the three that we're talking about so that's the single family apartment condo cooperative or co-op that's these three right here that we have been talking about up till now. And in that single family, remember, there is a thing called a attached living. The next one's called a PUD or a planned unit development. With every one of these that you see here on the screen, these would actually be zoned residential, right? 
And if you want to go get something commercial, you would have to go through zoning and get it zoned commercial. Well, there are some situations in which a developer may want to build a huge development And in that one development, he may have commercial property up front, like restaurants, McDonald's and Starbucks and things like that. Then here they're going to have um, retail, shopping, and back here are some high-end houses. And then he's going to put a special unit or a special uh, property and put a golf course. And over here is an apartment complex. He would have to seek out different zoning and go through the entire process for every one of those. Or he could go and get a PUD zoning, a planned unit development. By definition, a person can be born live, die, and never leave a PUD because it has everything on it. If I were only going to build houses, I would just seek residential. If I were only going to put one golf course on it, I would seek special use. But because I want to create a whole entire community, I want a PUD zoning and think of a PUD zoning like an asterisk. This developer would go in front of the powers at B and lay his plan out on the table and say, okay, here's what I want to build. I want to build this and this and this and this and this. And I want you, instead of arguing for this zoning here and this zoning here and that zoning back there and this zoning up, I just want this wild card. I want to be able to build it all in one area. Therefore, I am seeking a PUD. A PUD is a wild card. The analogy that I like to use is that snow globe. You guys have ever seen those snow globes? You know, a snow globe, you pick it up and you shake it and you set it back down and all the snow flickers and it's beautiful. You pick it and you shake it again and then it all floats down in a different location, but it's still beautiful. Theoretically, a PUD is the same concept. Because it is a wild card zoning, anything fits anywhere. So realistically, you could take that land, shake it up, and what happens is the apartment complex happens up here and you put the McDonald's back there and you put the golf course over. That legally would fit inside of a PUD because it's every zoning or no zoning, depending on how you want to look at it. It's a wild card. You can do whatever you want inside of it. Now, in the real world, what would probably happen is the second they start deviating from the plan, the powers that be would send out a building inspector and go, whoa, time out, dude. That's not what you told us. We need to have another discussion even though legally it fits. Shake it up, put it down. Fits. Shake it up, put it down. It all fits, okay? That is a planned unit development or a PUD. Now, the next bit one, it looks similar, but I, here's where I want you to understand. There are what we call these mixed use developments. Some people have actually used the word mud. I have never heard that. <laughs> this is that distinct zoning in different buildings. This mixed unit right here. Now, it looks kind of the same, but this is what I was talking about earlier, where you would actually have distinct zoning inside of the building. So the first two floors may be zoned C2. Then the next 20 floors may be zoned residential 20, which is an apartment complex. And then the top, maybe you're going to sound, sell really cool high-end condos. That's going to need to be zoned residential 1. 
there are multiple zonings inside of the same building. So you could argue, well, that's kind of like multiple zones. No, it's an unzoned, and you could shake it up, and it still legally fits. Here, you cannot. You cannot all of a sudden decide, oh, I'm going to put the restaurant at the top of the building. No, because it's zoned for residential. You can't put that zoning anywhere but where it was designed to be. This is the mixed unit or mixed zoning or mixed use is the most common word. This is what every industrialized city in the United States uses, specifically in downtown areas where they may put a restaurant or shopping here, and then they could put office buildings here. Um, if they put office, it may be zoned something else. Let's say apartments, that way it'll go with this R20. And then here they put a condo and somebody buys the $2 million condo and here is a restaurant. That's a very common mixed use, all right? It is distinct zoning in very distinct locations, and they cannot be changed like they could be theoretically in this PUD. They have things called converted use. This is the new chic thing that you see a lot of. Well, it was an industrial building, now it's an apartment complex. We have converted the use. That requires a zoning change. It was zoned industrial in the 50s, but now it's an apartment complex and it got rezoned and everybody lives in those big lofts, apartments that used to be industrial space. Factory built housing. <clears throat> There's not a lot on the exam, so I kind of skipped this section. Understand that now a lot of these new home builders that are building this actually build them in a factory. They may build the trusses and the walls and all that, and then they ship them to the location on site, and then they just stand the wall up and stand the wall up and go, ta-da, we're done, okay? Not a lot of conversations on that. 